So good afternoon, everybody. You are watching Just For My People. And today I have a special guest. Please introduce yourself, my friend. Uh, Quasey Daniels, uh, Dr. Quasey Daniels of Tuskegee University. Amazing, amazing. So we are starting a new podcast series and we'll be talking to folks who have an interest, commitment, passion when it comes to land, design, um, how space is utilized, occupied, um, stewarded, conserved, and in some cases, we'll be talking about agriculture, farming. Other cases, we'll talk about architecture. Today, we're going to focus on architecture and design and how we, uh, how space and our environments can affect our social processes. Um, again, I'm coming from the point of view of Black land ownership, and we are working to try to empower and encourage folks of African descent to own more land. Um, so should we call you Dr. Kwesi, or what, what, how do you like to be referred to? Um, I mean, I guess this is a professional space kind of pseudo rocking out. I mean, I'll go with Dr. Daniels. It's kind of new for me still. So I'm like that kid in the candy shop. Uh, I just got the degree in August. So I'm like, yo, I'm Dr. Daniels. You know what I mean? <laughs> Amazing. So, so can you tell folks a little bit about yourself? Um, like professionally and what your educational background was? So, um, so I'm professionally trained as an architect. I uh, studied at Tuskegee University um, and left Tuskegee, went to University of Illinois, Chicago, and earned a master's in architecture. Uh, from there, I uh, worked in, as a professor um, in, in, in doing architecture on the side for a while. Really got into sustainability at the same time. And uh, at this time, sustainability really was not a term. Like now it's like, it's so commonly used, it's overused at this point. Uh, but I jumped into the space before people even, there was really no definition, large scale about what it was. And so I went out trying to find everything to understand what this concept was. It just seemed so dope. Um, and so spent about four years playing around with that and then decided I wanted to get some more advanced training in it. Uh, so I got a master's in sustainability management from Columbia. Um, and then um, decided that well, I kind of need, you know, if I really want to stay in this space and kind of playing and realizing there's more, we need more thought leaders, um, I decided to pursue a PhD in urban geography. Um, and so um, I'm now currently department head of architecture at Tuskegee University, um, carrying those titles. And we're currently also um, developing a historic preservation program. So I'm kind of playing in a lot of, a lot of spaces right now. For people that don't know, uh, could you give them an idea of what sustainable development is or sustainability is, and uh, maybe touch in on the historic preservation a bit? So um, the, the, the basic concept of sustainability uh, that I really ride with is the idea that there's no waste. Um, so, it, you know, realizing that as we gen it really kind of falling in line with how nature does things, you know, there's no waste. All waste is an input to another product process. And so I kind of, I continue to carry that idea forward of if there's no waste, um, then how do we take that product that's produced that we would call waste and find a new life for it? Um, so there are a lot of different theories um, or concepts. One is like circular, um, a circular economy or, um, you know, regenerative thinking. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of different things out there, but, you know, in a nutshell, that's how, how I approach it. And so that also ties into historic preservation, which is, uh, for me, I, so from an architectural standpoint, I see buildings, I see urban spaces, I see rural spaces, I see post 1960s riots, you know, post 1990s riots, post 2000s riots, post 2020s riots, right? There are all these spaces that, one, there's this cultural legacy um, that's embedded in these buildings that have burned that needs to be preserved, um, and those that have burned and some that, and those that, that have not, that there's, there's erasure that can begin to happen as uh, while we're fighting for certain, um, for certain changes to happen, there are other changes that are occurring simultaneously that if we don't capture it, it will be gone forever and there'll be no record. And unfortunately, that's more impactful to us. Um, and, at, and simultaneously, there is a necessity to, to know how to 
preserve your spaces, right? Um, you know, we can burn it down, but we also got to build it back up. You know, it's like that old parable when you go you know, at, at your house. I don't care if you dirty your room. You know, I said, tell my kids, I don't care about you dirty your room. Just know you better get in there and clean it up. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, we can we can see our spaces and go through the ch- the, the necessary changes that we need to take. But at the end of the day, we are the ones who are going to have to get in there to do it. And if we don't believe so, we just have to look back at the last 40 years post 1960s riots. So many of our spaces stayed neglected. Um, and I'd say a lot of that has to do with just our lack of understanding of how to do the work in some cases. Yeah, one of one of the uh, guys that we partnered with um, did his thesis on historic preservation and how it sometimes is a tool to preserve colonial or European uh, cultural product. And that could be in the buildings or architecture in neighborhoods. And for some reason, our community doesn't or hasn't been given the tools to utilize that as a way to keep our cultures preserved or sustained. Like, again, we think of some of these beach communities uh, that were in Maryland or um, Massachusetts or some of these, you know, these areas in the South where people have owned land for hundreds of years but aren't able to retain it and aren't able to get the, the local municipality to protect it. Um, what puts you in the direction of understanding historical preservation? And are there any examples where you, you've seen it utilized um, to retain heritage? Oh man, yeah. Um, so, you know, I've come to the preservation, you know, say God kind of directs your steps. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't set on the path, I was kind of placed on the path. And I, my first project uh, around historic preservation was in my f- third year of architecture school. I did an internship in Philly, um, in North Philly specifically. And we had, you know, that project was one of the first ones where they were preserving African-American sites all over North Philly. So we looked at six projects that we were able to work on. Um, the John Coltrane House. I mean, growing up listening to jazz, you know, John Coltrane, that's, a, that's you know, an icon, legend, right? You know, and here I'm in, his, I'm in the house where he did his magic, right? So I'm like geek. I'm like, yo, this is dope. So then we go down to, um, uh, we did some work at the Distant Mansion. And so if, you, if you're you familiar with Mother and Father Divine and, you know, during the Great Depression uh, and the work they did, particularly in black communities, it will, you know, the um, Divine, uh, Divine Lorraine Hotel was one of the only hotels where blacks and whites integrated uh, couples could actually come together and find a place to sleep. And, and black folks could also get a place to sleep in a lot of spaces around the country. Um, and the, the, the uh, Divine Lorraine Hotel was, was one of those spaces where it was possible. So there was this whole history and culture, again, start, you know, starting to understand through that preservation work. Um, and, and then, I mean, we did a bunch of other ones that were really it was just mind blowing of, of that culture. Fast forward about 10 years later, I had, had the opportunity to work with um, descendants of the um, uh, Macon County syphilis study, um, it's better, you know, also known as the Tuskegee syphilis study. So uh, in that process, I got a chance to understand sustainability through a social lens because we were working with, uh, we were asked to help with the, pre- the preservation of a sh- uh, the Shiloh Rosenwald School. And so if you look at Rosenwald schools, this about 4,000 schools built throughout the Southeast of the United States. That was this idea generated by, by Booker T. Washington. Plans were created by Tuskegee architect, Robert R. Taylor. And you wind up getting these 4,000 schools built. Well, when you fast forward you know, 100 plus years later, we're helping to restore this building. And I got a chance to see how you could actually bring community back together, how you could help change narratives about who, who are the spaces and who are people are just by preserving a building. Um, and it, it touched me in a way because I started to see we don't understand the memory that's associated with space creation. We see a building and we're like, oh, that's just a building. It's dilapidated, tear it down. Or it's pretty, I want to live in it. You know, I want to use it but we don't understand these buildings actually contain history and memory and culture. This is where I got married. This is where, you know, I, I met my first, you know, my first crush, had my first kiss. Like these are real deal memories that are tied to, to people. And if you preserve, when you preserve those spaces, you also preserve those memories and you create opportunities for people to gather. Um, and so we're, we're now doing the same thing with the preservation of civil rights sites. 
in, um, in Alabama. So from Montgomery to Selma to Tuskegee. And the beautiful thing about this work is sometimes you got to carve out a whole half a day just to get oriented to where you are before you can actually do the work that you've come to do. So it's, it's amazing. It's really amazing work. Yeah, I think uh, for folks that may not be familiar with this topic or this issue, they would say like, wait, architects, like, don't y'all draw stuff? Like, what, what's all this history? What, what's the uh, kind of social elements to it? And some of the things you're talking about may seem esoteric to people, but this concept of the way we transmute and the way we utilize space and the way we build in space affects the human process. And that process leaves in a way a residue that affects future processes. Um, in terms of understanding that history, how important is it for you to be down at Tuskegee and the fact of, of kind of the self-starter elements and how the Institute began in the first place or kind of how do you see that connectivity to history in, in your current work? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually bridge this with uh, my, my PhD research and what we're doing at Tuskegee and how this comes together. Uh, because I don't approach preservation from like, I like to say this is not your grandmother's, grandmother's preservation, right? You know, uh, we're not here with the sole intent of preserving white spaces. I mean, it's cool, got a lot of people out there who can do that. Uh, but our spaces, there, there is a real need to understand how to address them. So when I was doing my research in Philly, I was looking at the social impact that Drexel University was having on two communities, Mantua and Powhatan Village, two neighborhoods adjacent to the campus, the campus is expanding, and these two communities are being impacted. Well, uh, Mantua specifically was this predominantly black community, had been black forever. Um, if you're familiar with MOVE, for those who don't know about MOVE, check them out. They, their first uh, incident with the police happened in Powhatan Village. Um, and if you're familiar with um, you know, gang violence that happened all over the country, one of the one of the people who helped to eliminate a lot of gang violence around the country came out of um, out of uh, Mantua community, COINTELPRO. You know, for those who understand what COINTELPRO was about, the folks who blew the lid on that, some of them lived in in, in Powhatan Village. So I mean, you're talking about two spaces that had major social uh, impacts, and there was a community in my, in the process of my research. I realized that uh, this one community, the Black Bottom. Uh, was eradicated. So as we talk about like land ownership, you know, through, you know, pol urban policies, you know, um, um, these communities were eradicated, urban renewal policies. They totally wiped out. 666 families were displaced uh, just to expand the University of Pennsylvania. Well, here I am like 40 years later looking at Drexel University expanding and Drexel's right up the street from UPenn. Um, they did some urban renewal work themselves, but now I'm watching another, a new, another black community that's being wiped out. And I realized in that moment, there was a real need to preserve that culture. Like at the end of the day, that might be the only thing you can say is that we preserve the fact that we can put an X mark right here and say you were here. And so when we look at the work that I'm doing at Tuskegee, um, we're approaching preservation very aligned with the history of our institution where we, you know, we bought some land and we had dilapidated houses on it and we realized that the only person who's going to help us was ourselves. And so we used our education to teach our students how to build the spaces that we needed in order to do the work that we needed to do. So we looked at the ground, said, hey, there's some dirt down here. Let's turn that dirt into, into bricks. Uh, and began a process of making bricks to build our campus and build our buildings. And in that process, we built our community. And in that process, we built black communities all over the, com the country, from uh, Grambling to um, Eatonville, Florida, to uh, Whitesboro, New Jersey. I mean, you know, you know, we look at Black Wall Street. Tuskegee played a role in Black Wall Street. Like, this idea that you understand how to build your space. Well, I look at now when we're looking at preservation, it's the same thing. Who's going to come and preserve those spaces? If you don't know how to get in there and restore the space, don't think somebody else is going to come in and restore it and give it back to you, right? You know, uh, if I restore it, I'm taking it. 
So if we understand how to restore it, how to preserve it, we can also tap into financial, uh, um, financial and legal instruments to assist us in that process. And we can do some things that can allow us to stay in place as we do that work. Yeah, I mean, how did you even get into architecture in the first place and then find yourself at sustainability and preservation work? Um, so I got into architecture, I was a kid, my mother gave me a book, A to, th a to Z occupations, A was architect, B was botanist, Z was zoologist. Um, I figured botanist and zoologist were too easy to say. So architect, I couldn't figure out, was it architect or architect? I was like, no matter what, that thing just sounds real dope. So I'm gonna try it, try it. And um, it's been a journey. I, I would just say that I, I, I believe that I've been guided you know, by forces. I'm a firm believer that our ancestors are always here, pushing us in directions that um, keep us where we're supposed to be. And so it was really by, um, uh, by other hands that placed me at Tuskegee. Um, Tuskegee is the place where black architecture began. You know, the first black architect in this country, Robert R. Taylor, uh, was trained at MIT and then came to Tuskegee and built and designed most of its campus. So, you know, this legacy of architecture, um, Tuskegee is like the dopest place on the planet because this is where, this, this is where it began for us. This was where our DNA first got started in America, um, for, for, um, the profession of architecture, you know, I mean, we know that we've been in instrumental in shaping the entire country and the globe forever. But um, if we start with when architecture started in this country, Tuskegee started in 1893 with architecture. Um, and architecture didn't become a thing in, in America until 1868. So we are, you know, 30 years post architecture coming to this country um, or at least a professional trained program of architecture and the Tuskegee jumping in, you know, a little less than 30 years later. So, um, you know, that's how, that's how I got to architecture and then sustainability and preservation. Um, I've always had this desire to figure out how to address the needs of our communities. Um, you know, I grew up learning about how things were supposed to be following the civil rights movement. Um, and how, how our communities were supposed to look. I just didn't see that. And I've been on this journey for like 20 years trying to figure out how to solve, solve that question for that little kid in me who's still walking around trying to figure out why does this place look like this and why my streets look like this and why the business, businesses look like this or why there are none. And um, going from New Jersey to New York to Atlanta to DC to Chicago to rule Tuskegee and you know when you're in black space and it ain't because of black excellence it's because of dilapidation it's because it seemed like someone decided to cut the lights out as soon as you crossed over that invisible invisible boundary um and drop a whole lot of things that aren't for our benefit so I've, I've been on this journey to really understand how to connect these dots so that as as you know, as I go and talk to folks and talk to students, I can tell them how to be equipped to, to address the needs of our communities. Yeah, so something that came across in some of our research was how few uh, young folks of African descent end up in the field of architecture. I was speaking to a, a young woman um, who's an architect and who's black, and she was like 0.4% of architects in the US are black women. In terms of in, in total, the percentage of architects that are black is far below a number of other industries. What do you think makes architecture such a white space or so prohibitive for people of African descent? So um, the numbers are correct. Um, I mean, they're less than, I think less than 500 licensed female, African-American female architects in this country. Um, less, you know, we're, we're around about 2% when it comes to black architects in general. Uh, but I, I, we got to be clear that if we look at other professions, you find very similar things, right? Sim very similar statistics, whether it's law, whether it's medicine, whether it's sustainability, whether it's urban geography, whether it's having a PhD, whether it's being, um, you know, uh, you know, studying, you know, studying anything. I mean, all the spaces that I go in, I'm one of very few, right? Um, 
So, I, I, but that, I mean, we know that's all by design. These spaces require you to have advanced degrees. How many black people can we say have uh, bachelor's degrees in terms of the, 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 the majority, you know, in, in terms of the full population? How many have master's degrees? Well, you gotta have at least a master's degree or a bachelor's of architecture in order to study architecture. Um, so, I mean, if, if you can't get into school or if we know that, let's take what we know is that a lot of black people live in urban areas. If we don't think that's true, we can just look at the election results and we can see where those predominant blue areas are, where well, that's where a lot of black people are. So a lot of us are living in urban areas. We were funneled into these spaces. A lot of these urban areas are underfunded when it comes to education. Quality of education is way below where it needs to be. So if you're not trained in order to do well, even if you're the valedictorian of your high school, that does not mean that you're equipped to right. survive when you enter college. And if you don't go to an HBCU where it might actually run into folks who are sensitive to the needs that you, you know, these, these deficiencies and actually want to see you grow, then you might fail out within that first semester or second semester. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of barriers um, that, are, that are very clear. I, I also believe that part of it is that we don't understand the value of architecture as a profession. Um, you know, for those who recall 9-11, we all know the, the impact of 9-11 on the New York City skyline. Um, that's architecture. When you have, we define our, where we are in space based upon the places that are around us, the buildings that are there. You know, when I give you directions, it's like, yeah, go down the street, make a right at the McDonald's, right? <laughs> you know, go down the street, you're going to see a, a, a school on your left. There's going to be a, a gas station on your right, um, and there's a big red house. Make a left at the big red house. I'm two more. I'm two 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 houses down from that. So we understand and we we orient ourselves based upon space and those objects that are in space. And architects have the beauty, beautiful opportunity to create that space. Uh, but so many of us come out of environments where we're not a, we're not allowed. We're not given license to create. And so we don't even know that this is an area for us. Um, we, don't, we don't meet people who tell us that this is an area for you. And then again, sadly, if you go to you know, a lot of programs to learn architecture, you're gonna be constantly reinforced that this is not a space that's for you to, uh, to operate in. Yeah, it makes me think of two things. One is how, how few people who aren't in the field understand what city planners do, architects do, and how much of how space is utilized in an urban environment is dictated by an office of people. It mm -hmm. wasn't until I started looking at purchasing where I realized this area has to be commercial. This area has to be residential. The buildings can only be this tall. The buildings have to have this density of population. We want the city to grow in this fashion. And it's like, wait, who's deciding all that? They didn't come ask me, my mom, my aunt, anyone where I live. And it seems also that architecture is a very difficult field and it bounces a lot of people. Um, and for the amount of education you need, some people think it doesn't pay the equivalent of like what other professionals would make with that level of, of education. Um, do you find that to be the case? Do you think people are somewhat misinformed about the profession? Um, do you think there is an element of it's just really difficult and so people don't make it through? What, what are some of your thoughts on that? Um, it's tedious, um, extremely tedious. Uh, as a profession, it truly is no different than what you, in terms of the intensity that you find with the medical industry as you find with law, right? Um, uh, my, my son made a comment to my wife a few weeks ago. He said, wow, you know, doctors, um, lawyers, all these people are, are making money off of people's misfortunes. And I thought about, I was like, man, you're, you're right. So when we think about architecture, we don't make money off of people's misfortune, right? Yeah. You know, unless your city has been destroyed, you know, unless your house burns down, um, there's no misfortune. There's no need for you to come find me. But, you know, which means that I can't then just turn around and make my prices be whatever I want them to be. Right. But for, for, you know, a lawyer, you ain't got to see me now, but you're going to have to see me at some point, <laughs> you know, a doctor. 
don't worry, don't pay my price. You're going to see me eventually. So, and it's not, that's not knocking the knowledge they bring to the table. It's just, you know, when he said that, I was like, man, that makes a lot of sense because architecture has historically been a space for the elite. Right. Um, how many folks that, are, that have zero dollars are looking at who's going to design my house? You know, I'm going to move into a rented house. So that means that I have to first I have to own land in order to find an architect. Second, I have to have some money to say that I want to build a house here. And third, I have to believe it's possible. All of those mean that I'm not, I don't seek out, you know, the person who has the skills that you have coming as, you know, as an architect. Um, and so the people who generally will hire us will be uh, people who have money, municipalities, uh, because they have desires to plan out how their space gets created. Um, for me, I think about, you know, again, Tuskegee. How did architecture come to Tuskegee? We had a, we had a strong building campaign happening from 1891 to 1881 to 1893 when Robert R. Taylor arrived. But it was the expansion of Tuskegee's campus. It was the need to plan out the campus and make sure you were clear about where you were going to go and how you're going to do your work. Some visioning needed to happen. So that's why you brought on an architect. I need some visioning. I need someone who can, who can read the landscape, who can look at this thing from you know, 500 feet in the air and figure out what's the best way to orient my roads, best way to place certain spaces, how to organize people as they move about. So that was how architecture came on the scene at Tuskegee. It's very, it's very similar when you look at you know, urban spaces, rural spaces, the, the entire country. You need somebody who can look up from 500 feet in the air and make decisions about how you organize people in space. And that's where you, you know, whether it's an urban planner, city planner, urban designer, architect, we're all, all we are is just people who deal with it at different scales. You know, if you're an you know, industrial designer or furniture designer, you're at a very really minute scale, you know, architect, you're at the building scale, city planner, you're at the city scale, you know, a regional planner, you're at the regional scale. So, um, you know, it's just a scale issue, but all of us are, are in the business of planning space. Yeah. And it, it's funny for me as a person looking into space or as a person who has uh, rented spaces and wanted to alter them. And then first thing that always comes up, you're going to have to get an architect. You're going to have to file paperwork and you won't be able to do it yourself. It's almost paradoxical that everyone in a way needs an architect if they have land or something to build. Yet we aren't necessarily encouraged to go into those spaces of be the architect, be the city planner, understand, like you said, regional development levels and understand the timetables of 90 years, 120 years. We're not talking 10 year leases, 15 year leases. We're talking about structuring towns and cities and growth patterns that are estimated at 50 years, 70 years and, and greater. And that's not something I think that is made aware to a lot of the young folks I grew up around. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with, with you now serving in education, do you think that there's, with the internet, more information available for people? Do you think this is something that's still a bit um, insulated uh, to particular communities? And are there programs that you see that encourage more young Black folks to get into architecture? Um, definitely. Um, with the internet, there's a lot more um, access to information. Um, but the thing about information is you got to know what you're looking for. Um, you know, we, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's better or worse now. Um, it's like information overload. I, I go online, I search everything, but I don't necessarily, I don't always get to be very specific about what I'm looking at. So, um, there are a lot of spaces that there are a number of spaces developing that are introducing people to architecture. Uh, social media has made it really, really accessible to connect with people, see what, who's out there. Uh, the National Organization of Minority Architects, uh, NOMA, uh, their website is noma.net. Uh, you can go in there and you can find out about black architects, black architecture, um, people that are doing some really dope stuff all over the country um, and outside the country as well. Um, the uh, NAACP has a annual competition called ACTSO, A-C-T hyphen S-O, that takes folks, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a competition that's strictly designed to address certain, all professions, including architecture. 
So they do stuff like medicine and, and law, but they do have a, they have an architecture design component associated with it as well. Um, and then, you know, you have sites that pop up like Black Girls Draw, um, which was created by, you know, a young Black girl in, um, who's a senior in high school now that just, she got exposed and was like, yo, this is kind of fly, this is dope. I want everybody else to know how fly and dope this is. Um, and, and, you know, so I think as, as young people connect with this profession and they see how dope it is that I can take a pencil and I can reshape and rechange how people see the world. Um, this God-given ability to take this thing in my head, take my hand, put things together, recreate space, and then show you what I was thinking, man, that's so dope. That, that's so dope, you know? Um, and just the more, more of us that understand it and see it and realize there actually is space for you to play where we're playing, um, then we see more people come into it. Yeah, when you think, uh, for me, when I think of historically, whether it's with the Institute or even going back farther, this idea of the builders and the, the folks that had the vision to do that was so important. And this idea of like, even like Grand Architect of the Universe and kind of the, the awareness of how everything we see around us came out of someone's mind. Like when we live in urban areas, even mm -hmm. the parks and like the trees were planned and planted specifically for certain reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it took me a long time to realize like, wait, the creative drive isn't just painting, drawing, making music. People are being creative when they're building these buildings. They're being creative when they're coming up with new wiring and lighting systems. They're being creative when they're thinking about safety in certain mm -hmm. neighborhoods and how they place structure and how they place lighting and how they organize space. But by then I was already into being a sociologist or so being a mm -hmm. historian and mm -hmm had kind of missed the turnoff for certain other options unless I wanted to start over. Mm -hmm. um, with some of the work that you're doing now, are there means by which people, if they have an interest, can learn more? Like with some of the, the work you had done on uh, the gentrification in Philadelphia, some of the changes happening there, the, the directional research, or with some of like the projects you did with the photovoltaic work, if people are interested in these developments, how would they find out about it? How would they learn about the, these kind of trends and pushes in the field? Um, within the field, um, I mean, I think just searching. Um, if you're, you know, if you're looking at the work that I'm doing specifically, um, you know, my stuff is like, you know, you do a quick Google search, you come across a lot of things that are out there. Um, between YouTube sites, I have a website, quasidaniels.com. Um, where I'm updating that with more of the content. Um, just at Tuskegee University, you know, our website, um, we put a lot of the stuff out there. And I'll be honest with for a lot of this stuff, we're moving so fast, we're staying so busy that we, you know, COVID, I think, will give us an opportunity to actually say, okay, now let's put this out there for the world to see it. Um, you know, platforms like you are, for me, they're great because it gives me a chance to kind of take a step back and then have a conversation about the work we're doing. Um, because it, I personally believe there's just so much work that got to be done that I don't always have time to take, to pause and say, okay, let me document the work um, or, or even market it to people because we just got to get it done. Like, uh, uh, yeah, you just got to get it done. So when I, I mean, I, I, I really embrace folks who say, hey, I want to do an interview, or can you tell me, can you give a presentation or a lecture? I can pull that stuff together really fast. And it actually helps me because as I pull that content together, I'm also simultaneously documenting it. So it gives me a chance to kind of pause, take a step back, and put some documentation together to put, you know, to let people know what we're doing and just get back to work, you know, right after that. Well, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that um, photovoltaic project that you had worked on uh, with the solar panels? Yeah, so um, I've done a couple. I, we, so when I was in New Jersey, I worked for the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage and Finance Agency. We, and I was over there at Green Homes office um, as a coordinator and responsible for doing um, solar PV on affordable housing all throughout the state. Um, so that was an amazing project. I had a chance to uh, work on the ARA funding, it was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. 
uh, through President Obama. Um, and I actually got a chance to see like what that money looked like when it came from the federal government all the way down to the state level and to see like people's lives being impacted. Like if you're in affordable housing and your utility costs are really high, by bringing in uh, solar panels and you're able to help reduce some of that utility costs, people that are living in you know, senior housing, they can see a true, a true benefit you know, to, to their, their pockets. Um, in Tuskegee, we've been, I've been working with the School of Agriculture. Uh, they recently have done some, um, some PV installations to train folks in the community and students on campus how to install PV. So again, to, to reduce the, you know, our reliance on uh, non-renewable energy. Uh, for a lot of rural areas, it's important to be able to get energy out there. Although many of us live in urban areas, if you drive out to many of rural, so many rural areas, still do not have access to a lot of what we consider modern, modern amenities. And so being able to understand PV, um, participate in its, in its, in its installation um, has been you know, a really awesome experience for me. Uh, for people that don't know, PV is photovoltaic? Uh, photovoltaic, yes. Uh, so solar panels um, are, are known, are, are PV for short, or photovoltaics, uh, photovoltaic panels. When I was doing a science project, maybe in seventh or eighth grade, my grandfather helped me to build like a little motorized, like mini fake, not a car car, but just like the little movable engine and like wheels and use solar panels. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this is like advanced technology. This is in the eighties or whatever. And he's like, no, solar panels have been around for decades. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, how come they're not being used more? And mm -hmm. he was like, oh, oil companies buy solar companies and then dismantle them. Or there's a lobby that stops this from being big because people are making money right now. Uh, do you still see having to fight for space for renewable energy? Is there, I know there's a growing, a growing green trend, um, but some of it is kind of tied to like with wind, they used parts from auto. And so it's kind of a, a sustainability thing of, well, people that used to work in this field can work in this. Mm -hmm. um, do you see there being more room for solar now? Is it still a fight? Are, are larger entities and municipalities seeing the value in solar? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think there's still, there's still a major fight. Um, spaces where no one wants to relinquish control, right? If I, what is my incentive if I, have, if I have an industry and I make money off my industry and that industry keeps me eating, um, supporting my family, what incentive do I have to see this industry transform without my participation, right? So I, I think part of it is pure human, you know, survival mechanism, right? I'm in an oil industry. Uh, I have no desire to see the oil industry go south because I didn't give permission for it to go south. <laughs> I gave permission to keep making my money, all right? So when folks come along and say, hey, we got this new brand new technology that is going to be perfect because it's going to put oil folks out of business. No, nah, I'm not trying to go out of business. I didn't give you permission to go out of business, right? So there then says, well, how do we find a middle ground um, where I can keep making my money and I can make money over here. Or I make a transition and I make that money over here. And I think that's the battle that I see. Um, when I was in New Jersey with the program we ran, uh, it was magnificent to see the new strategies that could be employed with solar. I mean, we were able to make people who had, who had um, uh, deals for, uh, to do affordable housing, we could make them make those deals make more sense because we could find savings from doing renewable energy and energy efficiency work that could then make that affordable housing unit go up. And this was not like affordable housing of big projects like we knew, you know, Cabrini Green, you know, in Chicago or any other housing projects we see all over the country. I mean, it's some beautiful, beautiful housing spaces, high quality built spaces that were being popped up that you can now do because you found new mechanisms to cut savings to, to the cost of that construction. Um, but I also literally, I mean, watched that industry tank overnight uh, because of greed. Um, you know, because people didn't wanna, didn't wanna manage the market properly, you allowed people to jump into the market who could 
you could eliminate the demand. And so if you eliminate the demand, you had a greater supply and it just became a huge problem. Um, and so I got a chance to watch in, in New Jersey specifically, um, I watched that industry go from booming to tanking within you know a matter of months. Um, I mean, it's still going, but not like it was at that time. Right. Um, come to, I come, I've come to Alabama and there's still heavy, heavy resistance. Um, you go to certain places around the country. Uh, I think in Alabama, there's a tax if you put solar on your, uh, on your house, right? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you wow. know, uh, yeah, you know, it, there's, there's, um, there are a lot of games still being played with folks who, like I said, at the, at the end of the day, I make my money and I'm not interested in not making this money anymore. So the idea that you're going to come up with a new solution that puts me out of business, I kind of have a problem with that. So I don't, you know, um, but change is the only constant in the universe. So as more people become aligned with ways to keep money in their pocket, um, to really do some dope things, you'll see, you know, you know, the industry will push itself. Yeah, when we talk about sustainability and pushing against trends, I've noticed in certain places, like uh, there are parts of New York where you're not allowed to have uh, a garden and let other people eat the food because they're worried about heavy minerals in the soil or they, there's no one that would check or verify, you know, your soil, this and that. There are places where you can't do water reclamation. Is the only way to change this just straight legislation, lobbying, showing up at city council meetings? How do people take more control over the environments in which they live if they aren't architects or city planners? Um, I mean, yeah, definitely at the legislative level. Um, uh, you gotta work in the system and I think outside the system simultaneously. You know, it's in the system, it's outside the system that people in the system find, you know, ways to make things happen. You know, uh, you know if we look at like, you know, a program like WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, um, the Black Panther Party worked outside the system because they said the system ain't working for us and started to provide food for women, infant, and children. And then all of a sudden, uh, by working out the system, someone in the system saw that and was like, that's a great idea. We need to adopt that. And now we have the WIC program. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think it's simultaneously that in the system, it's, it's a system. So it's established to continue to regenerate itself and continue to operate, you know, kind of autonomous, autonomously. And it's when that system starts to break down for people that people will say, you know what, this system ain't working for me. I'm going to do something else. And the system then looks at what's happening and is saying, well, I need to get back to working again. If working again means that I need to adopt some of the practices that are happening on the periphery in order to regenerate myself and keep moving. And that's what it will do. So I think that when, what I found in working in urban areas, um, you know, we talk about the system, the system of, um, of housing, of urban renewal, of, of spaces being um, usurped, people being pushed out of areas where they were living, you wind up having massive amounts of, of, of vacancy, abandonment and dilapidation in a lot of urban areas. Well, a natural outgrowth of that as, was that people started to say, hmm, how do I take, the, I'm tired of looking at these eyesores, I'm gonna make this thing, put this thing to good use. So they decided that they wanna create urban gardens. Right. And so in the process of creating urban gardens, they were able to start feeding themselves in areas where there was no food. They saw the value, but, uh, but the problem was as they created value for themselves, it also created value for other people to see these areas as useful again. Um, so I, I think it's working out of the system and in the system that you know, as a result of this solution that was outside the system, a lot of urban areas are at this point saying, how do we invest in urban gardening. Right. Um, the city of Philadelphia, huge urban gardening campaign you know, program. Um, New York City has one as well. Newark, New Jersey, same. Detroit, same. Chicago, huge. Uh, Milwaukee, huge. I mean, you have Atlanta. You got these, these hubs where urban gardening has become a huge topic of conversation. It's, become, it's becoming an industry. People are really exploring it as, as a solution. It's, been, it's starting to be usurped by the, by the system. 
but it only happened because people were outside the system saying we have too much vacant land um, available that's continuing to be underutilized that I want to utilize it. And I think I can grow food and put some money back in my pocket. And, um, you know, so I think it's a cycle, but I support it all. Yeah, up here, there are a couple of places. Uh, there was a Havana Outpost. Uh, it was a restaurant or kind of gathering spot. And they did solar and water reclamation and actually were able to sell energy back to the grid. Mm -hmm. And when we first heard about that, I was like, wait, you can, you can sell energy to the company? You don't have mm -hmm. to be paying for energy? Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why are people telling us about this? Mm -hmm. When we were, when I, I started looking into kind of this idea of some of the differences in urban and rural spaces, um, kind of pushing this concept of activity and being able to dictate what happens when there are changes. So maybe doing community land trusts. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing that like uh, in the Bronx, there are folks up there who are collectively purchasing commercial space and then having influence in the new and working with developers and, yeah. and saying, you know, we won't be able to stop it. In New York City, yes. growth is happening. Yes. And we won't be able to stop the mayor, stop any of the local officials from giving deference to developers. But what we can do is be partners in how this development happens. Exactly. 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 I would say check out um, uh, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, that's outside of um, in Boston. Uh, they, they established the Community Land Trust in the, in the 1980s, one of the premier or, 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 or forerunners to the movement of what we see now. Um, and it was a, a direct response to how do I meet the needs of my neighborhood? Right. Uh, and I was blown away. I, I, I went out there a few years ago, heard about it. It was like, I got to go check them out. And I'm walking around. I'm coming mm -hmm. out of Newark. I'm coming out of Philly. I'm coming out of areas where dilapidation and black space go hand in hand and they're like yeah this is all affordable housing i'm looking around like where <laughs> i'm not seeing any dilapidation and they're like yeah well we own all this we make decisions collectively um they they said like, uh, every they have a board that every ethnicity they have a representative of every ethnicity in the community on that board and when a new ethnicity came in they were, they were immediately elected to the board to make sure they had that representation. And for me to see them be able to have an intact community while development was happening all the way around them, and they did exactly what you said. They said, I have, um, there's this development happening. You're gonna have to hire minorities or women business owners and or local folks and the contractor said, well, we don't, we, those people, in order to hire them, they're going to need to have certain credentials. Right. He said, okay, tell me what those credentials are. And so they went ahead and they trained the people to have those credentials. And then they said, all right, now we have the list of people that you need to do the work. Well, that's the kind of um, creative uh, engagement that has to happen if we want to see our communities really improve beyond where they, where they are to realize that in order for the development to happen, and happen, we're gonna to have to hire people, but we're gonna to have to be proactive in making sure that our people are there. So if you try to say, well, I can't hire anybody, you can say that's not true because I got everybody you need right over here and they're qualified to do the work. So, you know. In, in a way, it's almost learning the rules of the matrix in order to uh, like create a solution or to create a response to it and recognizing like some of these loopholes can be utilized in our favor uh, but we have to actually understand the rule book to then recognize what some of those loopholes are. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we got to be creative, right? You know, um, I always find interesting looking at, like, prison shows. You know, there's always these prison shows. And it's funny because you always see a system that's trying to figure out how to keep humans from being human. And you see humans coming up with solutions to your problem, right? And I think that just blows me away. Like, <clears throat> exclusive of the, the negative issues associated with it. But you say, all right, you can't, you know, we're going to take out all of the creature comforts associated with um, being in prison. So we take out 
working out gear and all that stuff. And then folks start figuring out how to work out on the ground and they do push-ups and sit-ups like, and they come out big still, right? You know, um, we can't have any alcohol in the prison if someone figures out how to make their own hooch inside prison. I ain't never been in there. I know it's only what comes out. But to me, that's, that, that just shows the power of the human mind that we thrive in challenge, right? If you give me a challenge, I'm going to find a solution to it. And so we got to realize that all these challenges that people put at us is just begging us to find solutions. So rather than focusing on the challenge as being the problem, recognize the challenge is actually the solution. Give me more challenges. I love to think. I love to be creative. I love to find the solution in that challenge. I love to challenge myself to find, to prove that the impossible is easy, right? And so it's in that, in doing that work that we can find, you know, new avenues to make things happen. Yeah, it's something that uh, we work on with the students at at high school where I am. It's this idea of learning, starting with existential crisis and like, all right, the world is here. We're born into it. And in a certain way, it immediately starts being a threat to you. And so you have to figure out your safety, your housing, how the world around you works, the science, how to build in it, the math, um, how to communicate with each other. And that basically the, the human brain is an analogy-based problem-solving computational device that it, it is made to deal with new phenomena, figure it out, and come up with solutions. And we should be excited by these challenges and that we aren't made to do repetitive over and over same thing. We aren't made just to memorize and spit it back. And that in a way our lives are given meaning and purpose by some of these challenges. And so when we think about in our environments, how do we develop the solutions? How do we come up with some of the ways to meet our challenges? How do we root our educational interests in, well, actually what does my community need? Not just Mm -hmm. what's the most lucrative job, not just this is what's on TV and looks super amazing, but actually when you're around you're like, how come this? Or why isn't there more of that? To Mm -hmm. start that as the, okay, now there's a space for solution. Now now there's a space for problem solving. Exactly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I, I, I really appreciate uh, A, some of the, the, the projects that you're working on and your excitement around it. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up in a second. Before we do, can you explain a little bit for folks uh, the statue uh, that, that's behind you there? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, the, the statue behind me is, is known as the Lifting the Veil of Ignorance uh, statue. Um, it's a depiction of Booker T. Washington and a young man. Um, and there are three interpretations. And um, two of them are ones that I've heard before. The third is mine. I like mine better. I think it's doper. Um, I think it's more accurate. Uh, I, I might be biased, but that's okay. Right. Right <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is on Tuskegee's campus. So this is, this is one of the central features of our campus. When you arrive on campus, you see this statue. And um, the, the interpretation, or better yet, before I talk about the interpretation, I just describe. So you have a young man, he has a book in his hand. Um, the, the statue symbolizes Booker T. Washington's educational philosophy of education of the head, the hand, and the heart. You know, this is a philosophy that was adopted from Hampton uh, Institute when, where he studied before he came to Tuskegee. Um, and the, uh, his other philosophy of learning to do by doing. So it's this idea that um, the head is represented by the, by the books that are there. Um, you know, so you have a book, you have a compass and a, um, and a scale, or, I'm sorry, a compass and a um, protractor that are, inside, that are on top of the book. Uh, that's, that's the head. He's sitting on top of an anvil uh, there's a plow as well. You can't see that. It's behind it. And there's some blacksmith tools that are behind him as well. That symbolizes the hand, the labor. Uh, and the head, I'm sorry, the, the heart is the pride. Um, and you're doing for the community. And that's symbolized by his outstretched hand. So that outstretched hand saying, here you have the head, you have the, 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 uh, the, the hand. I've taught you how to use, utilize those things. Now take these out to society in order to make the change and be the change agent for society. And that's where you, and do it with pride. And that's where the heart comes in. And also that outstretched hand is also saying, look at what we've created. And that's the campus of Tuskegee. 
where you look at a campus that was created by students utilizing our curriculum, utilizing the head to hand um, philosophy, and then at heart, they took that knowledge out into the community and improved the community uh, both outside of the campus and all over the country and outside and, and also uh, around the world. Um, so there have been three interpretations. Uh, one interpretation is that he's lifting the veil of ignorance above the eyes of the young man that's right there. I don't vibe with that, that, that particular interpretation only because when you look at that veil, if you, if you lift that veil or don't lift that veil, that book, that anvil, that plow, all that stuff is still going to be there. That young man, he's still strong. Whether that veil is list, lifted above his eyes or not, he's still going to be strong, right? So it doesn't, it, that particular piece doesn't, doesn't vibe with me. Well, then the second one was, well, and this one was by uh, Ralph Ellison in his book, Invisible Man. Uh, he stated that, you know, and he was a, he's a Tuskegee graduate. He said, uh, you know, when I look at the veil, uh, the, the Lifting the Veil of Ignorance monument, I often question was he lifting the veil up or was he actually putting it down over his eyes um, again I don't vibe with that one as either because when you look at the work that Booker T Washington did around this country um, it's mind-blowing one of the one of the most dope men people humans to walk this planet uh, his impact on our community and on the world um, is so underappreciated um, and under and under understood that um, it, it, I just say folks just rock with it. The work you're doing around land development, you just look at the work that Booker T. Washington did with Tuskegee. Uh, there was a Southern Improvement Company, uh, which was a goal, which had the goal of increasing black land ownership in Macon County, Alabama. Um, he did tremendous work around this idea of land uh, for African Americans. The whole campus was designed to take, and the work we did was to take us out of sharecropping, because uh, we all know the issue with sharecropping as an industry, um, to keep, get us out of sharecropping so that we could actually do something for us and, and actually own land. So I highly encourage folks to check out that. So it's as a result of that work that I say, he couldn't have been putting the, you know, the, 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 um, the veil of ignorance over our eyes because we wouldn't have done the work we've done. Uh, so then it says, well, who was he lifting the veil of ignorance from? And so my interpretation is that he's actually lifting the veil of ignorance from the eyes of society because he's saying, look at who we are. You're the one who's ignorant, right? So if this veil is down or the veil is up, no matter what, we're still going to do the work. But you keep placing a veil of ignorance over us saying what we're not capable of doing, yet we've proven time and time again what we're capable of doing. So let me go ahead and lift this veil of ignorance one more time from over your eyes so that you can see our true greatness and understand that we got, some, we got a lot of stuff with us, rock with us, and we, we make some beautiful music together. You know, we can build some communities um, through, the, through education uh, of the head, the hand, and the heart. Word, word. Yeah, I would definitely encourage anyone who has the opportunity to learn more about how Tuskegee started and some of the, the endeavors uh, around and what Booker D. Washington did in terms of the actual building, the orientation to um, providing people with skill sets that were useful to the community, and then the traveling and the figuring out how to raise the money, how to run a university, and all this happening at a time period where uh, the trend wasn't to be super supportive of <laughs> African Americans in various spaces. Mm -hmm. um, well, he's a, he, he's a strong, he's a, he's a great example of what we say about figuring out how to make the system work for you. Um, very honest about the work he did. Um, and he found supporters. We always, there's always, I mean, even now, there are a lot, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. We, black folks ain't the ones that are all in the street. Yeah. You know, yeah. you ain't been to a protest, you need to get to one. You're going to find that we, uh, we outnumbered a lot of times. Find supporters. You know, there are a lot of people who, who vibe with humanity. A lot of people who vibe, who vibe with, with justice and believe that they're, you know, everyone should get a fair shake. Um, and so in our efforts of finding, finding those supporters, finding those friends, um, just be clear about what your goals are so that you can properly give them the guidance on how they can better support you as you do the work. All right. All right. Well, I appreciate you sitting with us. Uh, before we take off, is there anything you want to leave us with or anything you want to let people know about? Or? Um, Outside of just say, you know, just reiterate, you know, I, I highly encourage folks to check out Booker T. Washington. 
Um, he wrote about 13 books. All of them are freely available. Most of them are freely available in Google Books. Um, read about Tuskegee. Um, right now, I personally, you know, besides you know being an alum and now now an administrator and professor at Tuskegee, um, I say I just I've, had, I've just had the grand pleasure and honor to be in a space where I can learn every day about the greatness of of, of this space that I that I'm in. But I believe that it's something that for everybody who's interested in understanding how to do the work, all you got to do is look at him. You know, all you got to do is look at the campus and say, if I, real talk, I try to, I try to be, do the work that we're, we were trained to do. And it is, it is hard. It's a hard, hard task. Um, but that's the character. That's, that's what lets us understand if, you, if, if, if this is the work that they could do, you know, you could build collegiate scale buildings with untrained labor that were students that you trained to do the work and they went about doing that work. Um, and you just basically you just got down and did the work with your hands. You know, you trained yourself how to do it. If they've already done it for us, let's stop reinventing the wheel. You know, study what people did, figure out what their philosophies and their strategies were and get at it. Um, the last place I would say, check out Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, it was one of the first, it was the first incorporated black town in the country. Um, and there, and I'll leave you with the motto, Isaiah uh, Montgomery said to the people when he, he started to, when he started to settle the land, he looked around him, he said, all of y'all have done this work. You've helped to build this country for everybody else. Your grandparents did it. You've done it. Now I charge you to build build some space for yourself. And they got at it. So um, I would encourage folks to look at these spaces. Um, there are a lot of historic black towns and settlements. Oh, last piece, real quick, real quick. Um, I believe right now we were talking at the very beginning about what COVID has afforded us. We can literally work from home and put money in our pocket anywhere in the world. So the idea of the exodus from black spaces into urban spaces in search of new money and ways to take care of our people, we actually can turn that paradigm on its, set, on its head. The great migration we've always talked about, I say there's a, we, need to, we need to do a Mecca you know, we need to do a hajj back to our black spaces. We have a lot of historic black towns and settlements all over the country that would greatly benefit from all that brain power, all that intellectual capacity, all of that understanding, and all of the resources that we've garnered over the last 80 to 100 years as we moved to the cities. We can actually move back to these spaces, restore these spaces without changing our economic status, actually improving our economic status. Because you can make that money, you can buy up these spaces, and you can transform them and make them what they're supposed to be. Gentrification is only a, is only a bad term because we're not the ones doing it in our communities. But if we do it in our communities, it becomes a resurgence and a renaissance. So I'll leave you with that right there. Word. Now I appreciate that. That that's amazing. It was, it was great speaking to you. And full disclosure, I also went to HBCU. I went to Morehouse and had a chance to go visit Tuskegee because I was looking at veterinary school and blown away when I was on the campus. The people that I met while I was out there, I loved that part of Alabama. I was only there for two days or what have you. Um, and I, I remember the day because I bought the dead prez tape. Uh, let's get free for the drive yeah, yeah. from Atlanta. And just had my mind yeah. when I got out there. Um, yeah. And, and I ended up going to Columbia for grad school. So I, I love the open. No, no, um, no. And, and so, yeah, I, I wish you the best in all your endeavors. Again, uh, for people who are looking to find you, let them know your name again, how they can find you. Uh, Dr. Kwesi Daniels. Um, you can find me at Tuskegee, kwesi.a.daniels at gmail.com, uh, or Google me. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I don't go hard on those two, but I'm on them. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely out there. You know, just drop a line. I'd be glad to, glad to have it. Man, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, good luck with all your endeavors.
Hey, appreciate you. Thank you.